you don't have a ton of time or a huge budget to maintain your landscape, it can feel a little bit out of reach. It can feel very stressful. So in this video, I want to share some landscape design tips for busy people. I have some big picture project planning advice. I've got some design tips, very specific design tips, including my way to make a messier landscape seem neater right away. And I also want to highlight a few areas where you should not cut corners, areas that have a very high return on effort invested. So if you're short on time, you don't want to skip these steps. My first advice is to start with a list of all of the small steps you think your landscape will require and then prioritize that list. And it sounds a little bit obvious to just start with a to-do list, but it's, it's more than that. You are trying to make a list of bite-sized steps. And when someone hires me to help them, you know, as a landscape designer, to help them make a plan to refresh their landscape, this is what we're going to do together. We're going to make this sequenced list of, of what you should do first, what you, what you should do second, and then break it down into steps, little steps that you can take. Because when you're busy, landscaping isn't your main focus. You probably only get these little chunks of time where you can chip away at a project. An hour here, an afternoon there, and this is okay if you plan accordingly and, and making this list of the sequence of steps that you can take to chip away at a project helps tremendously. That being said, if you are short on time, remember that every little bite-sized project that you take on will actually have three steps to it. You've got the preparation for the project, the project itself, and then the cleanup after the project. When you're short on time, it's good to view every little bite that you take on as having three steps to it. The preparation for a project can include finding tools, sourcing materials, ordering materials. Maybe you need to do a little research before you take the project on. This could be viewed sometimes as its own step. Then the cleanup and proper ethical sharing of any unneeded, unwanted materials or disposal of, of anything that needs to be disposed of. If you have yard debris, for example, you want to make sure this is dealt with properly. Tools need to be put away. To some of you, this will seem obvious, but I share these tips because if you're short on time, viewing each task as this three-step process can help you stay organized and prevent you from getting caught halfway through a landscaping project with a mess on your hands. Next, I want to share a common mistake when approaching hiring help. And that's uh, if, if you don't have a big budget for hiring help, uh, you can sometimes view it as sort of an all or nothing thing where if you don't have a lot of money to spend hiring help on your landscaping project, then you're just going to do it yourself. Or you think if you're going to hire a company to do something, then they need to do all of this something. But the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that you can get very nuanced and very specific about what you hire help for. It can be a very small part of the process or the or, or your landscaping project, but it can be that thing that you dislike the most that you ha don't have the tools for, whatever you're dreading. An example could be if you want to fix just one garden bed in your space, you could hire help, hire someone to come in and amend the soil if even necessary, and then mulch, get rid of the weeds, uh, just a very small part of the process they could come and do, and then you could come in and make the design yourself and plant it yourself or just the mulch spreading alone, you can hire someone. There's companies that'll come out in a day and just spread mulch on your entire landscape. This might be worth it for you if that's something you're particularly dreading. So consider what you like, what you dislike doing, play to your strengths and, and call and get some bids. Sometimes when you hire help for just a very small part of the process, it can help you get a lot of momentum very quickly uh, and not cost as much as you may expect. And some professionals have access to tools or resources or knowledge that you may not have access to. And then that time versus money trade-off might, might really be worth it. I think this is the third time I've mentioned this on my channel, uh, and I'm going to mention it again just for good measure. But stockpile needed materials on site as much as you can. This is, of course, easiest for people who are blessed with the right space, but I encourage you to get creative. See if you can find a corner to store some extra materials, embrace that big pile of mulch, Get soil delivered and cover it with the classiest tarp you can find. Because especially if you are busy, this can be a surprisingly stressful bottleneck. Ordering the right, the perfect amount of materials, and then you have to get it all moved in a certain amount of time, and the stress of running out of time, maybe it takes longer for whatever reason, then you have this pile in the way. All of this can make it so much more difficult if you're, if you're short on time. But if you have a place where these materials can sit and wait safely, then it's so much easier to spontaneously go outside and chip away at the project. So now I have two shortcuts that f folks who are short on time, they, they frequently take that you should avoid because it can actually cost you more time in the long run. Do not take any shortcuts when managing any aggressive or invasive weed species and do not take any shortcuts when it comes to properly mulching. These are two subjects that I cover frequently on this channel. So summary, if you're short on time, it can feel like a waste of time to slow down and identify invasive species on site uh, to learn a little bit about them. But it's a very important step because 
not all weeds are the same. Some weeds can even be beneficial in certain ways. Uh, even within invasive or aggressive weed species, some are going to be worse than others. It's good to know what you're de dealing with so you can prioritize a bit. The more aggressive, invasive, or even dangerous a weed species, the higher it is on your priority list. Some weeds can create perpetual maintenance problems. They can spread into neighbors' yards. They can disrupt local ecosystems. Either you spend time managing it now or you spend more time managing more of a problem later on. Similarly, mulching can seem like a really big undertaking. It takes a lot of time uh, and, and then you have to invest in the mulch itself sometimes if you can't get arborist chips, for example, for free. But this investment will really pay off. The time, energy, money you spend mulching is going to save you time, energy, money on weeding and watering and your plants are going to be happier and healthier. Also, a reapplication of a dark colored, for some reason, dark colored woody mulch materials are very popular. It can really freshen up the look of your landscape almost instantly. So if you're just trying to neaten things up really quickly, make your neighbors happy, make it look like you're putting in an effort, reapplication of an organic woody mulch material can be the way to go. If you would like to learn more about mulch best practices, what materials to use and how to go about it, I have some other videos on this channel. I'll link to that as well as some resources. Uh, I have a video about managing weeds. I'll link to that all in the description below this video. Now I have a few more specifics, uh, some design tips as well. So after you're managing invasive species, you're mulching, these are some other things that you could include on your list of bite-sized steps that you are prioritizing. It can be helpful to stand back and notice the biggest eyesores in your landscape. Look at your landscape overall, identify it, and then prioritize those biggest eyesores. Deal with them one at a time. And sometimes just taking out a few, cleaning up a few of those can really help freshen up the look of your landscape. Remember, of course, that messy isn't always bad. A neat, sterile looking landscape is not always the ideal goal, but if you do have the more picky neighbors, for example, if you're working in your front yard, then just prioritize those eyesores. Sometimes you only need to take out a few. Next, my sneaky trick for making a messy looking landscape look neat is to neaten up the edges. The edges where two materials, two soil covering materials interact. So if you think lawn, sidewalk, if you neaten up the edge of the lawn where it interacts with the sidewalk, it's going to look so much neater. Your entire landscape is going to look so much neater overall. It's interesting, there's this uh, and sense of intentionality you're going for that is just, it's really popular in conventional landscaping. So if you want to just let your garden beds do their thing, you like the more messy look. Like I personally do, I want, I, I like ecologically friendly landscaping where plants can take on their natural form and overlap and grow together. But if you have a really neat border around that garden bed, it's going to look so much neater. It's gonna be way more accepted by those who prefer that conventional landscaping look. Expanding on this, a trick if you have just a kind of a messy looking landscape overall, you're not sure how best to neaten up the edges, sometimes adding a pathway around the edge of some garden beds, you could be very intentional with where this pathway goes, so it takes folks on a nice journey through your yard, but having a very neat pathway through an otherwise messy space can neaten up the space overall. For a little extra simple sparkle, of course, you can add a few more flowering plants. And I recommend perennials over annuals whenever possible because then you don't need to replant them year after year. There are perennials that are low maintenance, drought tolerant, and that can bloom over an extended period of time, like a couple of weeks, for example. And there are some that are pretty budget friendly too. There's tons of options out there. Wherever you live, you could do a little research to figure out what's best for you. You can also, uh, if your budget is tight, ask some friends if they have some extra perennials on hand that more than likely they have, uh, folks, folks tend to have a few that they're willing to share. I also recommend having things that bloom at different times of the year. You don't necessarily need to have something blooming in your yard all year, that can be fun. But if there are just certain times of the year where things are looking a little bit flat, go to the garden center then and, or just walk around your neighborhood and just see what is blooming at that time in other people's yards at the garden center and then try to get a little bit of that to add, add to your landscape. And when possible, consider investing in shrubs instead of herbaceous perennial plants because there are new cultivars of shrubs that are being bred constantly to grow to certain sizes, compact sizes. Sometimes they are bred to have more blooms or bloom over a longer period of time. And shrubs can compete with weeds a little bit better sometimes. If they cover more soil than perennials, then you need to mulch less, you need to weed less. They can be less maintenance than herbaceous perennials, but sometimes they are a little bit more pricey. If you would like to learn more about how to research great plant possibilities for your yard. I have a free mini course. It's called How to Choose the Perfect Plant and it's linked in the description below this video. All you need to do to access that information is create an account, like a username, password, 
so you can keep track of your pro progress as you move through the course. So again, that's free. It's linked in the description below. I, I hope it helps you. Automating irrigation is a very common tip for folks who are busy, who don't have a ton of time to spend on their landscape. The next best alternative is to select plants that are native, climate appropriate, and drought tolerant. So it is possible to have a landscape that does not require any irrigation once established though. So remember that anytime you plant something new, it's going to need some irrigation until it gets established. Even drought tolerant plants, uh, they just need a little bit of help as they develop their new deep root systems. So you could use a sprinkler temporarily for the first couple of dry seasons. Just help that plant along till it gets established. And then at that point, no irrigation. It, it is possible. Whenever possible, I recommend embracing a little bit of mess because this neat or sterile, perfect looking landscape, it, it's not, landscapes aren't supposed to be that way. This is actually a construct and it's a social pressure for some folks uh, more than others to try to maintain this really neat, sterile look. It takes a lot of work because you're fighting what a landscape actually wants to be, what it's supposed to be. And it's to everyone's mutual benefit when you let plants take on their natural form, when you don't cut back the stems on your perennials, native pollinators will sleep inside those stems all winter. Or if you let the leaves fall off your trees, then uh, the birds can scratch around and, and find little tasty bugs to eat. It's to everyone's benefit when you lean into uh, embracing a little bit more of this mess. And it's a balance, and I hope I've shared some tips so you can strike that balance. You know, you could have these neat, clean edges and then embrace that messy looking landscape in between. I highly recommend involving family and friends in the landscaping process and turning it into quality time as much as you can. It's a great opportunity to include uh, some of the kiddos in your life too. Help them learn more about gardening. Maybe they can select plants that they get to choose, that they get to take care of. Anyone who will share the finished space will enjoy it so much more if they're invested in it too. Remember that landscaping can be way too easily viewed as just another thing that I have to deal with. And this is understandable, especially when we live in a culture or an environment that is demanding a certain level of neatness in a landscape. This is something on a pressure, something on your to-do list. But if landscaping is viewed as just another thing I have to deal with, then it is definitely going to feel that way. But getting exercise, sunlight, connecting with the space, creating something beautiful, beneficial, uh, spending time with loved ones, with family, with friends. All of this is something that's worth looking forward to, and that can all be incorporated into your landscaping project. I hope that some of these tips will help you save time on your upcoming landscaping project, hopefully reduce some of the stress for you. Uh, if you have any additional questions, please share them in the comments below. I can't always respond to everything, but I try to read everything. And then your questions, your comments are informing upcoming videos. I definitely keep feelers out for the trends. Um, thank you everyone. We just cleared 30,000 subscribers, which I never, ever expected when I started this channel. I had no idea what to expect, so I'm really excited to keep producing tons of gardening landscape design content for you all. If you have uh, particular requests, again, share them, share them below. Thank you so much for watching and happy gardening!